Hi there, my name is Peter Dykes and I'm the Associate Principal Oboe of the RSNO. March is RSNO Principals Month and today I'm talking to our fantastic Principal Flute, Catherine Bryan. Hi Catherine. Hello, thanks for having me. Well, you're welcome, it's great to see you. It's been a while since we were actually performing together. It's nice um, to be back in this, this room again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the heart of Glasgow. Um, so, Mozart's Flute Concerto number one. He wrote two. Yes. Tell us a little, little bit about the piece. Well, it's um, very well known to all flute players um, for reasons that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later, I think. But um, it's, it's a beautiful piece. It's, it's quite a simple piece of music in a lot of ways. Um, and I think it has, for me, this kind of joy um, and elegance to it and quite a lot of simplicity as well. Um, but I, it, it sort of is one of those pieces that makes you just smile and, and relax when it starts. Um, it's quite regal um, to me in some ways, and we'll maybe talk a little bit about the key um, mm -hmm. a bit later, but it's in the key of G major, which I think is the key most often used for God Save the Queen. <laughs> and I don't know whether that's what makes it more regal to me, but I do feel <laughs> it has that, that sort of, that nature to it a little bit. Fantastic. I didn't know that about God Save the Queen. That's a very good point. Um, uh, what, what sort of um, specific characteristics of the flute are on show in, in, in the piece? It's very lyrical. Um, also virtuosic in a very sort of elegant, effortless way, as with most Mozart. Um, but it's, I think it shows, obviously the instrument was very different then, um, but it shows that sort of singing nature of, of the flute. Um, the range actually is quite big, um, considering when it was written, because obviously the flute did not look like this <laughs> when um, Mozart's flute players were playing it. Um, but it, it, it definitely kind of uses the flute to its um, fullest level in terms of range and, and dynamics. Fantastic. What sort of, you mentioned sort of, you know, the instruments of the day, mm. what kind of tonal difference would they have had then? So, um, it would have been a wooden flute yeah. um, and that would have made the sound lighter, sort of airier. Um, wooden flutes tend to have that sort of more mellow quality, the, the, the metal flutes are a little bit more direct. So obviously in terms of projection, you get much more on a silver flute than you would back then. But obviously then they would be using much smaller ensemble, not actually that much smaller than we were using for yeah. this recording, but um, smaller than traditionally we would play um, a concerto with these days. Um, so I think in a way, perhaps there would be less colour variety um, in an instrument of that time, whereas now we'll kind of be able to create something that has a lot more um, contrast. Um, and that for me is something that I really like to try and find in the piece now when I'm, when I'm playing it. Um, often things that aren't necessarily in the score because there's not a huge amount of information in the score. Um, so it's nice to be able to sort of use the flute to its fullest um, capacity. Fantastic. Uh, I know this is probably a little bit of a, um, a strange physics question, but <laughs> just thinking about, I've sometimes seen people with, just with the wooden mm. head joint. Um, and I assume that's to sort of halfway replicate that that sort of style. Yeah, is, yeah. Does, does, it, does it, I assume having a wooden lip plate sort of splits the air differently or is it? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think a lot of wooden head joints that people use nowadays are actually lined with silver, so you still get oh, the same projection. Right. I mean, you're talking to like the least geeky flute player <laughs> on the planet. I know very little about um, these things and I play with the same flute. I have one flute and that's what I play all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, even to, so my flute, for example, you can see here has a gold um, lip plate, um, but the rest of it is silver. And the reason I like just that little bit of gold is it just gives a slight... Um, sort of difference to the sound. I mean, minute difference is really more to the player, I think, than the, the listener. Um, whereas a complete gold flute has quite a different sound, much, much brighter sound. But this little bit of gold gives me that little bit of brightness. So I suppose with a wooden, um, sort of wooden lip plate or a wooden head joint, you'd get a little bit of that um, sort of mellowness to the sound without committing to it fully and you'll still yeah. get the kind of projection and obviously the, the reliable mechanism of a silver or gold flute. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so you, are you telling me that you, you've never been a regular at those um, 
NFA flute conventions with thousands <laughs> of flute players? I have been to a few <laughs> flute conventions in my time, um, but uh, I think I spend most of the time chatting to people <laughs> rather than trying out instruments. About uh, talking about anything other than the flute. <laughs> yeah. I often I think about, imagine like, a, what's the other one called? ITG, International Trumpet Guild. Could you imagine the trade rooms? <laughs> Everyone's just trying to play a top, whatever. I know, and flute is quite similar. It's deceptively loud, the flute, <laughs> so, uh, and piercing at times, so, uh, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, you mentioned keys mm. in Mozart. Now, of course, uh, Mozart and, and the keys that he wrote in were so sort of inextricably linked with the story he's trying to tell at the time. You know, it could be, and so, of course, that links in with opera. Um, you know, um, C major, D major, sort of militaristic, or magic flute, E flat major with three flats and the whole Masonic kind of thing going on there. Yeah. So, as you said, G major yeah. on the flute. Yeah, so quite unusual for Mozart. Mm. I think the only pieces that Mozart wrote in G major were Eine kleine Nachtmusik and one of the piano concertos, number 17, I think, the one in, in G, G major. major. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so, yeah, so it's quite an unusual key. I mean, you think of the, how prolific he was as a composer, you know, and actually there's very few pieces in that key, which is quite a common key, G major, you know, yeah. one sharp, we can kind of all cope with G major. <laughs> um, but yeah, it definitely, I always say um, when I'm teaching it that it has this kind of regal quality to it. It feels quite a settled key, G major. Um, and and this, this piece has that feel to me, you know, it has that sort of, it, it sits back a little bit. It's not sort of a um, really driven um, character. And it's interesting that it's marked Allegro Maestoso, which means mm. kind of fast but majestic. So he even kind of puts that in the in the title, which I think to me kind of marries the, the character that I would associate with that key, possibly to do with the God Save the Queen memory I have of the G major. I don't know, but <laughs> G just feels royal to me. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, also the national anthem of Liechtenstein. <laughs> There we go. Just saying, there you go. <laughs> um, it's things I learned from the beginning of watching international football. Um, I did find uh, what, playing in the orchestra for the piece, actually, mm. it's funny you should say that, that sense of poise, um, because I, I, especially in the last movement as well, it's so sort of um, rhythmically upright yeah. in a way. Um, and so I think just, again, just from the point of view of playing the orchestra, it has, a, it has for me, a a very different kind of arc than mm. uh, than the other concert, concerti in, in this in this uh, principles series. So, um, yeah, it's, it's 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 a really unique piece. Um, one one thing that strikes me, I've seen you play recitals and concertos before. You bring an amazing sense of um, creativity and also um, what's the word kind of atmosphere to when you're playing. I'm interested with a with a, a project such as this before mm. you're about to play, mm. being that it's it's a sort of recorded situation. What, what are you trying to, what's going through your mind about what you're trying to, to put across? I think that's one of the hardest things actually about recording, <laughs> just generally. I mean, especially as a soloist, because so much of my reason for doing this, this job um, is the communica communication with an audience and the performing. I mean, that's mm. what I love to do. So recording always, for me, I have to kind of overcome the fact that there is not anybody there <laughs> to play to in that way. Obviously, there's the the kind of your colleagues and, and the people you're making music with, with, which in turn has its own kind of communication. Um, but recordings always require a precision that, you know, sometimes can sometimes take the edge off the spontaneity that I might sort of throw into a, a performance. So I suppose it's really important for me not to lose that feeling of um, in the moment, even though quite often when you're recording, you're thinking about more specifics than you might when you just let go um, in, in performance a little bit more. So in terms of preparation for it, I don't know if I'd really prepare that differently. Um, I think always with any performance, you have awareness of places that you might need extra brain cells, you know, we're all like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think just kind of being aware of that. Um, but I try always to feel like I'm c communicating that music to whoever is listening or watching at a later date so that they still get that feeling that I'm speaking to them, you know.
you actually have a you know a, a, a parallel solo career alongside playing in the orchestra mm. you know um as you were saying, you know, an ever-growing discog discography. <laughs> and, um, and even during this sort of pandemic um, uh, situation, you've, been, you've managed to get around and do some international mm. um, solo performance work, and which, uh, which is amazing that you managed to sort of fit all, the, fit all this in. Where do you find the time? <laughs> anyway, um, um, so, uh, so th those sides of it, have you recorded this concerto before? I haven't, no. So it's sort of on my list. On the, on the list. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, because I've done, you know, all these concerto discs of kind of much more modern concertos, mm. but I haven't yet sort of gone back um, and done the earlier works for flute. So I would like to do it. Um, and I've got this pipe dream, and it po possibly is a pipe dream at the moment. <laughs> it might be for quite some time. But I'd love to actually, um, you know, I've done quite a lot of transcribing of other instrumental music. So I'm quite interested at looking in at some of the uh, Mozart's concertos for other instruments and whether I could kind of pair them alongside oh. the, the flute concerto. I'm always inspired by Mozart's violin concertos and sonatas, and I, I love listening to those. So. Kind of that's, I suppose, where I would get my main inspiration for my own performances of the Mozart Concerto. So um, I'm kind of interested in seeing what, what I could do with sort of transcription. You know, Mozart, Mozart did not, um, apparently, he did not love the flute. <laughs> and I always wonder if that was because of the instrument it was back then, if it, you know, it can do so much more now. Um, I think that with a lot of composers, do you think they would write now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. more than they wrote then if, if they could hear it it now um, and I think that always sort of drives me to explore music written for other instruments and singers um, and see you know how much I can get out of this instrument yeah oh I mean I suppose um, I mean Mozart himself borrowed concertos from himself didn't he because yes. with the other with the concerto being for the oboe yes originally so you know you're, you're following in a in a great tradition there yeah i mean in those days you know it really was much more just sort of pick up the instrument and let's play and you yeah. know um i think that's quite a nice um sort of ethos really to have that it's not actually about the instrument that's playing anything it's about how you're communicating it and what you make your listener feel um so for me approaching any piece, but especially a Mozart concerto, I try to think first about the character of the piece and what I want to convey with it, rather than too much about the technical demands. It's, for me, it's always better to make the technical demands of a piece fit what you want to say with it, rather than learning the technical things and then thinking, right, now what do I want to add on? Because it does become an add on then. So for me, it's much more about that is sort of your your primary objective um, and then you make everything work for that it's interesting you say that and of course um, some of the, some of the things uh, that we're talking about today um, are if you aimed at somebody possibly studying the piece or wanting to you know um, get some tips from the tip from the top about what to look at and things but you just reminded something uh, reminded me of something there um, a chat I had uh, quite a few years ago with somebody who worked at the Associated Board of the Royal Schools of Music. So if you're preparing your grade eight, I assume this, this is maybe on the grade I eight? I think so, yes. yeah, I think it is, yeah. Um, that, um, a real um, focus that they put on the, what they assess, they, they're, they're really keen to assess you as a musician, mm. um, as opposed to just an instrumentalist on, on the yeah. instrument, which ties in fantastically with I what mean, you're I mean, I just there. feel that that is what it's all about, really, mm. you know, um, I always say, when people say, what do you do for a living? You know, mm. I'm a musician. I wouldn't say I was a flute player, mm. a flute operative, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because I don't want to feel that it's just the flute that, I, yeah. you know, it's about communication. I mean, that's what music is, you know, it's mm. speaking to somebody uh, or, or, you know, through, through whatever medium that is, if you're listening, if you're watching, if you're, you know, working with people, um, it's all about that sharing. And so, for me, I think if you get too stuck in flute land, you can sometimes forget that that's our, our, the most important thing. So, um, so yeah, finding that sort of um, the soul of the piece, whatever that is, I think is, is number one priority. Here, here, <laughs> fantastic. This uh, particular um, performance was with a socially distanced orchestra. Mm. 
um, in, in, in this fantastic space in the new auditorium. How, this has been open for a few years now, mm. hasn't it? They're going to have to drop the word new. I know. <laughs> Just the thought. Slightly less new auditorium. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, was that particularly different, standing in front of a more dispersed bunch of musicians? Um, yes, no. I mean, yes. I think, I think just in terms of the fact that you sort of, there were gaps, like, you know, I suppose when you, you're looking around the orchestra and you're sort of, I'm trying to obviously communicate with the orchestra itself as I'm playing, you do have those holes and that does feel a bit strange. But I think everybody is, is so alert when we're sitting in that way and you have to be so in tune with everybody, not just in tune, mm. in tune, <laughs> but actually in tune um, with everybody around you that it kind of creates a sort of heightened um, sense of atmosphere in the room. I, I quite liked it. Um, I mean, as a soloist, I think it, it doesn't affect you as much probably as when you're actually in the ensemble itself. Um, because soloists are used to having quite a lot of space around them at the front and particularly me because I move around quite a lot when I play <laughs> so they have to give me space and my instrument sticks out and all these things. Um, but I think, um, I think the, I suppose the most important thing is that everybody's listening and everybody has that sense of communication. So really, the space shouldn't really matter. And I think that's hopefully what we've all found really in, in this time that yes, there are sort of slight things you have to think about with delay and, and things like that, but it's, the delay really is tiny. I mean, mm. we're not playing, you know, yeah. halfway down Buchanan Street. <laughs> we yeah, are all in the yeah. same room. Um, so I think sometimes it's best to just play as you would and, and, and just kind of enjoy it as you always would. Yeah, I, su I suppose, I mean, um, when we're on our sort of regular working kind of schedule, we're, we're going from different venue to different venue mm. to different venue every day anyway. So exactly. it's just a sort of version. I mean, of an acoustic can create often more problems than a distance, you know, yeah. playing in a different space. So I think um, I, I like just getting on with it, really. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Talking of getting on with it. Yeah. Right, so <laughs> the, um, I mean, um, so for somebody like yourself who's lived with this piece, you know, um, through all your formative years and, you know, obviously uh, reached the very top, um, the top of the profession and is uh, with incredible technical facilities and things. What, what's, what's a, what are the kind of technical challenges with this piece that it still presents to you today? Um, I think because in order to convey all of the characters that I was talking about in terms of this elegance and this sort of regal feel, it has to sound so effortless. That's the tricky thing, because actually, you know, there are passages that are really articulated, all this kind of thing, quite fast moving, um, but it needs to sound like it's the easiest thing in the world. So I suppose getting a kind of real fluidity with the, the tonguing, kind of actually articulating the notes, um, whilst maintaining a good sound throughout, that's always tricky. Um, just because you have to make sure, concentrate and make sure you have that awareness that you're doing it all the time. Um, for me also, it's not, I suppose it is a challenging thing, but it's, it's more a fun thing for me, is actually bringing out the quirkiness and the fun in Mozart's music, which is so often there. Mm. Uh, it's there in the flute and harp concerto as well. Um, and actually to make that kind of wit and lightness come across so that it doesn't sound like a chore and I think this is the, the problem, I don't know if you'd say problem, but because this piece is so often used as a piece for audition or it's used um, in everybody's formative years and you learn it and you study it, we play it so many times, it's hard to keep that freshness. And whenever I play it, one of the big challenges is making it sound like it's the first time I've played it. Hopefully not in terms of the notes, <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of the character, um, so that it has that, um, spontaneity and, and freshness and speaking from you know having sat on panels and heard this piece for many times for the listener too especially if it's somebody listening to it on a panel they don't want to hear 40 Mozart expositions in a row that sound the same you know so I always say to my students take something fresh in there that they won't have heard before and I think that also is, um, I was talking earlier about sometimes adding in little colour changes and 
dynamics that perhaps aren't there but really bring out the nuance in a phrase or the shape of a phrase. Um, I might not necessarily choose the same ones every time I play it, but I will always make sure that I'm bringing that contrast to the piece um, so that it has that vibrancy to sort of bring it off the page. That's great advice. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, fantastic. Uh, if you were to be advising someone in terms of playing the piece accompanied by a piano or by, mm. by an orchestra, um, because of course, you know, if, if you are going to do this in, in your grade eight exam, it, I assume you won't bring your own orchestra. Although you never know. Um, <laughs> Tricky what, at the moment. Yeah, possibly. yeah. <laughs> any, any sort of any thoughts or sort of forewarning that people might might be able to take into the process? Yeah. So I think the the thing about concerti with piano as opposed to orchestra is that with a piano you'll get an immediate response. Um, when you've got sixty people or. 40 or even 20, you're not going to get quite the same immediacy to a response. So um, there sort of has to be a feeling of sitting back a little bit on the flow sometimes. Not that it means it doesn't have the same direction, but it's just kind of being aware of the fact that you've got a collective ensemble that won't be there like the sort of percussive nature of a piano. Um, and I think um, also, I mean, in terms of the communication, I think communication is vital whether you're playing with one person or 40 people. But it's important to remember that the piano is like, is your orchestra for this piece. So kind of really allowing that, that bond to create. It's not, don't think of it just like you're just being accompanied. I mean, I always think that it's a, I think the Americans, rather than call, calling it your accompanist, they call it your collaborator, <laughs> which I always think is a much nicer way of saying it because it is a collaboration um, between two musicians, between 50 musicians, however many. So it's lovely to feel that you can actually communicate with your pianist or your orchestra, because quite often in Mozart, the ideas are kind of being shared or they're bouncing off each other, or it's a sequence, you know, and you'll hear an idea and then you play it or vice versa. So it's, it's nice to have that um, kind of feeling of sharing, I think. Yeah, it's, isn't it funny? It, it, let's say we've got, I don't know, the Pulak Sonata. It's not the Pulak Flute Sonata, it's the Pulak Sonata for flute and piano. Yeah. All you have to do is look at the front page of the score and it's like, oh yes, okay, right, I, I know, understand that. I know, I yeah, know. It's, yeah. it's, it's, and I think that's what's, you know, as I was saying, that's the beauty of making music, mm. is that we're, sh you know, we're sharing it with somebody else. And so um, I, I like that feeling of being able to communicate with whoever I'm working with when yeah. I'm actually playing. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's two Mozart flute concerti. Are there flute quartets as well? There's a, yeah, there's the Mozart flute quartet. That's lovely. So, really, so really that's, nice. that would be a, sort of an opportunity to work with string players. It's almost like a smaller version of how that interaction exactly. works. Exactly, yeah. To... It's beautiful, actually. That's one of my favourite works for flute by Mozart. Um, Fantastic, yeah. The D major quartet. So that's lovely. Um, and and there, like I said before, you know, it's very easy for, for a flute player to pick up a violin score and play it yeah. actually because the range is very similar so you know if, if you find a Mozart violin piece lying around play it you know it's um often just brings this sort of new freshness to the way you approach Mozart and Mozart for me is about shaping and direction and gesture it's very gestural music um and often other instruments will do that in a slightly different way than, than we will I, th I think I always, my gripe about the flute is that it's a very static instrument, you know, um, violinists have the luxury of a bow, so their, their phrasing often is more physical because mm. they actually down bow, or you can see my technique is absolutely marvellous. <laughs> <Nailed> <laughs> I don't know what this hand's doing. At least it's not that. <laughs> no, I've got the right side, but I'm not sure about my left hand. But, you know, I love the feeling that they have this movement and gesture, cellist too, you know, and I think sometimes flute players don't really do enough of that shaping mm -hmm. because we're just kind of this way, yeah. you know. But that sort of appoggiatura figure where the note is a sort of a dissonance resolved. The dissonance in Mozart is always so important. It's so expressive. To really kind of show that, I think it's nice to, to physicalize it a little bit as well. Yeah, physicalize that and the release. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. If so we're talking about a few Mozart pieces there mm. uh, with, with, uh, with this concerto being one of them. If one, if one of the, you're advising someone to take up the baton with one of them first as a sort of gateway to the others, which would it be? I would probably start with the G major. Right. Not because it's easier, um, 
but I think it's something to do with the key actually. G major is a nice key for flutes to play in. Um, the, the flute and harp concerto is also very accessible as C major, which, you know, there aren't any sharps and flats to worry about in the, in the flute and harp concerto. <laughs> um, but it's quite, it's quite fiddly and obviously you need a harpist um, for that. The, the transcribed oboe concerto is tricky. I think that's harder to, to, to technically get your fingers around. It's just the way it's written. Um, I always think that's quite interesting because it wasn't actually written for flute, whether that's why it's trickier. You can come and tell. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we play it in D major, so we yeah. play it in a different key. Um, but it's, it's also got a trickier start, as you'll know. Yeah. That trill and scale at the beginning yeah. of the D major concerto is fiddly. Um, whereas the, the G major concerto just starts on a nice crotchet G. <laughs> so, Here I am. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so that's quite nice. Um, but I think, you know, any Mozart when you're approaching it, it's just important to, to think about this, about conveying that, that character. So that we, we don't, I, some students of mine say to me, Mozart's just a bit, <laughs> just a bit boring. There's no way you can say Mozart's boring. Yeah. Um, it's all to do with what you, are finding in it and that's our responsibility I think sometimes to find um, things in, in music when there are less instructions than you'd get in something more contemporary to, f to find that and, and bring that piece to life. To individualise it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said the, uh, you mentioned that the fl flute and harp concerto is accessible. It is literally yeah. accessible <laughs> on the Friday night club. <laughs> it's still available. Um, so go, go and have a look at that. And that was from a, from a concert um, with, with yourself May, and our harp Yeah, uh, a couple of years, year, 18 months ago or something. Yeah, so with P ago. Pippa Tunnell on harp with Yara Sano. And um, always lovely to play that piece because it's so nice to have a kind of play, be a soloist, but actually have a collaboration directly with another soloist. Yeah. It's, it's always really fun. Yeah, I, re I, I really enjoy um, playing the orchestra for that. One of the things about, that, I, that I really enjoy about that, you were mentioning about, you know, um, working in with your, uh, with your colleagues on stage at the time, that was unconducted. Mm. Um, do you, not, not in terms of a, of a preference of having a conductor or not, but does it make it a very different experience? I actually don't find it that different as a soloist. Um, I th it probably depends on the conductor if, or, the, or the leader or, it's, or the ensemble you're working with. Mm. I mean, I'm quite a physical player regardless of whether, you know, so I, I like to lead and show mm. movement um, physically when I'm playing. So I think that lends itself quite well to playing without a conductor. Um, but I do like a conductor there also because I like that sort of, that relationship and that sort of, sharing of ideas and and there is a little bit less responsibility on you as a soloist if there's a conductor there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so um you know often that can be a it can be a hindrance very rarely <laughs> <laughs> but um so i'm kind of quite easy with either but I, I think um it's as long as there's communication as i, I keep saying the same word you know yep. but it is it's you just got one extra level of communication when the conductor's there. Um, I think as an orchestral player, there's a bigger difference between ha not having a conductor, but as a soloist, I kind of, I like both. You mentioned before about um, the things you, you the, that are important to bring across in this particular concerto. So some of this might have already been sort of answered a bit, but if you, if you let's say a student comes to you and says, oh, I'm learning the Mozart G major concerto. Um, have you got any sort of any, any, any areas that I should start working on immediately with the piece? I always think the best thing is to actually sit down with the music without your instrument. And I would probably say this with any piece really, but in slightly different ways, and have a look at how the phrases are structured, where they're going, kind of how you're shaping the music and about that sort of direction. Because that, for me in Mozart, if the, if, if the phrases don't have shape, I think the piece can fall really flat. So that I think is really important. And often it's better to sing, sing it rather than play it. Because we often sing more naturally than we play. <laughs> I, I sing very badly. <laughs> I think I definitely play more naturally than I sing. But in terms of shaping, you know, I think sometimes we will, you won't necessarily emphasize a random note when you're singing, but you might when you're playing because you're thinking about a million other things. So I quite like that sort of approach. Um, 
I think in, in all Mozart, but certainly in, in this flute concerto, there are technical, tricky technical things. Um, that's often to do with um, putting together sort of the virtuosity of some of the scalic passages with the articulation, which is the sort of slurs and tongue and all that kind of thing. Um, so slowing that right down and just being really sure of how you're um, articulating, where you want to articulate, making sure you keep blowing. One of the um, very kind of technical things for me is that when people articulate a scale, um, I'll see if I can demonstrate this, that they actually forget to blow, which sounds really crazy, but um, they'll sort of do rather than blowing through the phrase. So that is something that um, I think it's quite nice to just isolate um, passages just to, to see how that's working. And I suppose what I would say is I often use bits of this concerto to warm up. I mean, you can do that with any piece, but take little passages and actually use those to help your articulation or help your sound or um, help your intonation, whatever it is, so that you're not um, practicing technique and then repertoire, but actually the two become, two become two one. Become one. <laughs> I think that was a Spice Girls hit back in the day, showing my showing uh, rage, terrible yeah. uh, taste in music. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they do, and I think, you know, it's, then you have real awareness of the technical issues as you're going through a piece, which is crucial, you know, we can't sort of switch off the, the awareness as we, as we play, um, but it's being able to think about all these things at the same time that is the, the, the tricky thing and make it sound completely effortless at the same yeah. time. <laughs> As the Spice Girls do so well. Yes. <laughs> um, just a couple of sort of nuts and bolts things. Um, do, you, do you have any sort of preference on a particular edition if people ask you about that? I don't. Um, and part of the reason for that is that I know this piece so well mm -hmm. that I tend to, I don't actually know where my music is. <laughs> <laughs> so I tend to teach this piece from my own knowledge and memory of it. And because fundamentally my thoughts behind it are about the character and the, the shaping and, and even things like the articulation markings, you know, most of those are editorial, whichever edition you look at. So I tend to go with what I like and what I think works. And again, I'll quite often change that from piece to time I play it to the next time or to, from student to student or whatever just to try out new things. And if it mm. sounds, if it brings something to the music that is appropriate, then I think that's great. So as far as additions go, I treat them a little bit like a blank canvas anyway, and will come at it from, you know, with my own sort of thoughts. So no, I don't have a specific edition. That's all right. I think they're all excellent. Well, at least you're definitely not on commission from any particular no, publisher. Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, talking of sort of individualising the piece to yourself, what about cadenzas? Mm. What, what, how do you sort of go in for that? So I think it's great to write your own cadenzas, yeah. ultimately. I mean, there are some really lovely ones out there. And to be honest, my cadenzas, which I've written up, I mean, I sort of feel embarrassed to call them my cadenzas because I'm sure they're just an amalgamation of everything I've heard in all the other cadenzas over my, my life, you know. Mm. Um, and so, and, you know, a cadenza essentially are, um, is, sorry, elements from the piece that you're kind of putting together and, and, and sort of building in a way through other virtuosic things or, you know. What I love um, to show in a cadenza and what I think is important is to actually show as much in terms of um, colour and character variety as well as just the motifs. So it's lovely to have a moment in a cadenza where you can come right down in dynamic and show something different in terms of the colour. Um, Range-wise as well, there might be moments where you can kind of go really low on the instrument, perhaps more than is used in the actual movement and similarly high. I'm not a fan of going crazy high in Mozart cadenzas because I think it's unstylistic and I want mm -hmm. to sort of stay in the ballpark of, of yeah. Mozart's wishes. Um, but having said that, the, the flute probably didn't, well, it definitely didn't go up as high then as it does now. Maybe he would have loved a few top Ds <laughs> coming out of the cadenza, but it's not for me really. Um, so I think, um, I think don't, you know, take risks, don't be afraid to, to try things. And the thing about cadenzas is I've written loads over my career um, and I sort of see what, which one I'm in the mood to play that, that day. You know, I don't just have one cadenza um, and I will change and rewrite them as I, as I go along as well some of the time. Usually not actually on the stage, on the although spot. that has happened once when I <laughs> went a bit off-piste. Um, so that was a slightly more 
avant-garde one. <laughs> oh, I found <laughs> but, my way back. Though. Yeah, we got there eventually. Um, but, but that's what a cadenza essentially is. It's an improvisation. Yeah. So, you know, don't play it like you've practiced it for months. Yeah. It needs to sound like it's fresh. Would you ever just have a go at improvising one? I wish I could. I'd love to, but I don't trust myself. Ah. I think I, I don't know. I, yes, I, if there was no audience and no orchestra, no <laughs> as in audience. at home, <laughs> I might try at home and record it and then play it to everyone if it was, if it was good. But then <laughs> being the control freak that I am, I would probably then write it down. <laughs> yeah, I'd immediately transcribe it. <laughs> exactly. And play it the next time. That's um, brilliant. So, I mean, I would, I would love to be able to do that. Um, and you think on a flute that should be possible because I see pianists do it sometimes and it is incredible. You yeah. know, they've got so much to think yeah. about with all these different lines. We have one line. Um, so, yeah, maybe that's my post-COVID activity, activity is to learn how to not write my own cadenzas. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have one of the most sort of, um, uh, well, I mean, amazing capacities for memorising things that I've ever seen. I've never seen anyone sort of do entire recitals from memory um, and other than pianists, I suppose. But I mean, how have you got any, obviously you have a natural affinity with, with that as a process or that's part of your process, sorry. Mm. But do you, um, in, for, for when you're teaching and things, is there any sort of specific advice you give to people for memorizing? Um, yes. Um, the first thing I would say is only play from memory if you feel it makes you play better because I think right. some people really don't enjoy playing from memory. And mm. I would never force people to play from memory if they don't enjoy it because that's ruining their performance, you know? So it has to be something that you feel you want to do. And I, I like playing from memory. So um, just because for me, it gives me a more direct communication with, with an audience um, from the physicality of not having the music there. And I'm a starer as well. So if there's music there, I'll probably look at it. Oh, I see. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm like that in restaurants. I stare at people on other tables, I'm, apparently, <laughs> I'm told. Um, but I think in terms of approaching a piece and um, how to sort of memorise something, it, it probably depends on the piece slightly. But, I mean, I've memorised everything from obviously Mozart to pieces written in, you know, 21st century, which have no pattern. Um, yeah. And I always sort of go about the same way is that I'll take it in sections. And it, in a really complicated piece, that might be one line or it might be two bars or something, but I will, um, and I'm quite diligent about writing down what I've done that day in terms of memory and how good it feels. I also don't necessarily go about it in the order that it fits in the piece. So I might sit mm -hmm. down, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, but I might sit down with the piece and kind of work out maybe 10 sections and number them. And then I might memorize section one and then nine and then three. And then, because in a way, I think some of the stumbling blocks with memory is that we just rely on oral memory, which in my experience can be risky when you've got distractions of a performance. So. I like to really know the piece inside out so that I can fit the pieces together, you know. And it's useful in rehearsals too, because then if the conductor says, can we go from here? Oh, yeah. You're not sort of saying, well, I need to play the whole piece through to get me yeah. to that point to know where I am. Um, it, it just is a more thorough way of learning the piece I usually find. And then obviously I will then put it together in order. Um, but it's quite a good way of, of learning it. And, and also there's a particularly difficult passage to memorise for whatever reason, maybe it's more noty or, I could start with that and it feels like you're actually kind of making better progress than just always starting at the top. Um, and I used to have the feeling with pieces that I would always know the beginning better than the end. So this is why I changed my, my tactics a little bit. Um, so now I don't know what the, note the piece starts on, but yeah, I know no, how it yeah. finishes. <laughs> um, but no, that's just, I mean, there was, I could talk for hours about memorising because I've looked into it a lot and I do a lot of work on it because um, I like to try and help people with it because yeah. um, it's it's scary. Um, I suppose the one thing to say also is that if you have a little memory lapse, it's not the end of the world. Mm. And that I think I, it's such a shame when it becomes somebody's priority when they're walking on stage. Am I going to remember it? Mm -hmm. Am I going to remember it? Because in a way, then it, it's detracting from so many other things. Um, so it's sort of and I mean, we're all human. We all have that thought at some point, you know, but if you can feel you can kind of just relax into the, the making music side of it, um, usually I find then it 
once we relax and trust ourselves, it usually works much better. There's a fantastic sort of uh, cast iron logic behind what you th that kind of plan. That's amazing because it's sort of the, the, end, the end product. You would never think with the end product that, that there's that those building blocks go into mm. it. Um, and even if you know, if you are at the sort of, you know, let's say you're, you're, you're um, studying this piece um, and I don't know, you're in high school, but you, if your intention is to go to conservatoire, there will be, uh, there's memory obligation, memorizing yeah. obligations on you if, if, you, if you're going to conservatoire at tertiary level. So um, there's some amazing bits of, bits of advice there. And also I would say one other thing that's really important is to actually sit down and look at the music, really look at it. Yeah. Um, and read it through and listen maybe to a recording as you're reading it through. There's so much work on memory you can do without your instrument. And I think that's, that's really important. Even as far as like actually thinking about the notes and what they are and the note names, little triggers that can mm -hmm. kind of act like scaffolding as you go along, I find really helpful. So that if you do have a moment of complete, Ugh, which we all have, yeah. um, th there's, there's layers to fall back on. Yeah, that the worst memory is this kind of oral finger memory where we just kind of go and the fingers sort of do what they've always done. <laughs> because in, when I'm nervous, my brain stops sending that message <laughs> to my oh, fingers. Right. So um, that's, and I, I have had, you know, in my, as student times when I've really um, had those awful panic moments, which is why I've looked more into memorising and all these different layers so that I can do it with a little bit more backup. I should, uh, yeah, I need to go work on my memorising now. <laughs> but funnily really enough, I have an absolutely dreadful memory for lots of things in oh, life. Oh. I, for, I forget things all the time. Yeah. Um, and I don't remember things that have happened. Um, I'm just terrible. And I don't know if that's because my brain is so full of notes. Yeah, full of notes. <laughs> and the other thing is, funnily enough, I don't remember a piece often when I come back to it. I mean, Mozart, yes, it's yeah, usually yeah. in there, but pieces that I've memorised, like really contemporary things, I have to start again. Really? Okay. Um, which, not so much, I didn't have to do that as a student, but now I think my brain is crammed with more infinite, um, information these days, like the names of dinosaurs and things like that, <laughs> and the characters in Fireman Sam. <laughs> so maybe there's less room for the notes, but I think, you know, it's the confidence having done it. So if you want to start memorising, don't start with something complicated, just a little, you know, tune or something and build up because it's just training your, your brain really to think in the right way. So start small and then build up. And that's why doing a piece in sections is good. Um, look at your date that you need to learn it by and go back a long way. Because if you memorise it in loads of time, you can put it away and come back to it, you know, but it's, there's nothing worse than sort of the day before thinking, oh, I don't know what note I'm supposed to be playing here. You know, yeah. it's the worst feeling. Yeah. So sort of backdate it. Good advice. Talking of backdating, well, how long have you been in the orchestra now? <laughs> um, nearly 18 years. Nearly 18 years. Mm. And this is, this is your first job, isn't it? Yeah. So you actually haven't played um, the Mozart concerto exposition a zillion times in, <laughs> to get in, a job no no in, it's, uh, it was obviously okay <laughs> but it's, I'm here I am <laughs> but me back <laughs> yeah so. amazing um what's your sort of favorite repertoire to play in the orchestra oh there's so much um I th oh, do you know it's I this question always find really tricky because so many things I love French repertoire, and I think mm. any flute player that didn't say that would be kind of not being true to their, their roots. Yeah. Um, so obviously Ravel and Debussy and that kind of rep I love playing because it's so colourfully written for wind instruments and the flute obviously takes quite a pivotal role in many of those um, pieces. Um, but then I love Shostakovich symphonies, playing a Shostakovich symphony. I think for wind players, because he writes these unbelievably lonely solos, mm. it gives you this kind of emotional carpet to sort of, you know, put your stamp on, which I love. I love Prokofiev. He's one of my favourite composers, so any Prokofiev. And then I love a Brahms symphony, you know, so, it, you know, there's such a range there, really. Um, but it's... I think, you know, what's great about our, our job is even a piece that you've played a million times and you think, oh God, it's this one again. Mm -hmm. and you don't really enjoy it. Depending on who's playing, who's conducting, what the audience feel is, it can change your view of it completely. Um, 
you know, we, Beethoven Five is a great example. You know, that's not a piece that I get particularly excited about playing, but often I'm, that's the kind of piece that I'm really shocked that I come away from doing it for a week and think that was that was great. I felt yeah. really, I feel really invigorated now. So it's um, it's never the same, which is what's great, I suppose. Yeah, one of the joys, one of the joys of working with an orchestra yeah, yeah. such as this. Um, I, I'm more interested, what sort of, um, any particular players that inspired you as you were, as you were, as you were learning or? Um, I would say I was probably more inspired by um, non-flute players. And that isn't because there are not a, mm. a plethora of amazing flute players out there, there really are. And obviously as a student, I would listen to, to flute players. We're, we're so lucky we've got um, players like Galway who have just done so much for the instrument and the, the exposure of the instrument. So that, you know, I'm forever f grateful for that. Um, but I, I mean, I went to a music school, uh, Cheatham's in Manchester High School, so I was constantly kind of surrounded by really great musicians. Mm. So um, I was always like listening to other instruments and how they sound and what they could do. And that's always been a fascination for me. Um, sort of listening to violinists and thinking, well, that's, I want to try and do that. And I think maybe that's where the, the stealing repertoire idea sort mm -hmm. of begun in its germ form. Um, but any, I mean, singers are a big inspiration for me, perhaps because I feel the flute and the voice are very closely linked. So that listening to opera is just always my kind of go-to if I need a, a lift. Um, great opera singers. Um, as a student, I quite often had lessons with non-flute players. So I had a great lesson with clarinetist Michael Collins once. I'll never forget that lesson. He looked sort of beyond the, the flute issues, which yeah. I think, you know, it's sort of at the basis of a lot of the things that I've said today. It's about, well, I, we need it to say this. So how are you going to do that? Not, oh, I think your sound could do a little bit more of this. <laughs> you know, it can, it, it can get a bit analytical yeah. sometimes i mean i'm not saying don't analyze your playing mm. absolutely do but sometimes it's nice to have both aspects so you have somebody looking from a non-flute perspective and so i've always enjoyed that um i think probably my teachers have been my biggest inspiration in terms of actual flute playing and just the, the way that they taught me because i've been so well taught um so my my teacher at cheatham skeeter markson and my teachers at juilliard school Jeannie Backstress and Carol Incense were kind of just so, also different as well, but very, um, very good at explaining things. And I think great teachers are just inspire you in the way that they explain things and that hopefully I can pass even, you know, 5% of what they did for me. That's amazing. And you've got, you, you teach down the road mm. at the Royal Conservatory yeah. Scotland as well. So you have, and, and I assume in this, at these times where everything's happening online, for, for the better or the worse of, of, um, of Zoom teaching, you've, I assume you've had students from all over the planet. Yeah. Dialing yeah. in. So, and I've been doing some lessons sort of with people that have contacted me because this is the situation. I think it's actually opened up people's imaginations to where they can and who they yeah. can study with. So I've taught quite a lot of Australians yeah. that are in Australia, which makes a very early start for me yeah. and a late bedtime for them. But um, it's, I mean, it's great that we can do that, you know, and I'm a complete technophobe, but even I have managed to <laughs> work out what I'm doing online. And I think, you know, it's, it's just great to be able to still have contact with people and, you know, and one of the interesting things I've been saying with my students is that often over the medium of, as we were talking about recording earlier, and when you're not in the room with somebody, you have to work even harder to, mm -hmm. to, to um, convey something. Um, and that's actually really good training. Um, and quite often in, in the music profession, you know, if you're auditioning for something or applying somewhere, you have to send a recording in anyway. So to be able to get used to what's coming across on a recording is very good practice for all of us, I think. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, something's just popped into my mind about the actual orchestra. You, the, 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 the flute section, it must be one of the sort of the longest running established yeah. sections with the same people. I think, yeah, in the orchestra, it definitely is. Um, and we were talking about this um, on our flute Zoom chat the other day. Oh, we, <laughs> wow. We have a lot of these. Um, <laughs> we think we might be one of the longest serving flute sections in the country if huh. not the longest, because I've been here for 18 years. So 
that's 18 years and then without changing personnel. So it's just quite a long time. Um, I'm so lucky. I mean, I just have the best section. They are so great. And, you know, not just on a playing level. Yep. We just get on so well. And that sort of, again, it's to do with how you work with, work together with somebody. You know, if, if, if you care about them deeply as an individual, which mm. I do about my girls, my girls, my girls. Um, you know, we play better as a section because of that. It was just the support in our section is, is phenomenal. I think that's a sort of a dream really for any section. Yeah, and, and of course, and, and the, the Woodwind section as a whole mm. um, has had quite a sort of churn of players yeah. over the, in, during that time that, you, that you've yeah. been with the orchestra, but it's now sort of, it's now almost. Yeah, I think I've been involved in, stocked. other than my own section, I think <laughs> I've been involved in everyone else's appointments, so. <laughs> um, oh, wow, so, that's, yeah, yeah. So you're welcome. That's right, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Just think of the number of CVs you've read over I the know, last 18 years. I know, I know, well, the amount of Mozart expositions I've heard, oh. you know, on all instruments, but, um, but no, it's lovely. I mean, I think the Woodwind section's in a really great place at the moment, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's always been a lovely set of people, actually, even with the change of personnel over the years, it's always had a nice heart to it. Yeah. But I think in a way that continues because you, you want to appoint the same kind of players and the same kind of people. It sort of lives on, if you like, and I think yeah. that's what's so nice. I think it's one of the joys of the, um, for want of a better word, the British um, appointments process. We actually get to know them a bit, a bit as a person mm. before you dive in to actually appoint people. And as I do think to, that's so important yeah. because we're not robots, you know, yeah. we are, human beings that what we convey through our instrument is part of who we are you know it's the gift of your soul to somebody else to put it in a kind of bit of a deep but it is you know you yeah. have to pour yourself you have to be brave you have yeah. to put yourself out there and i think you know you have to to, to do that with people that you're comfortable with is a, is the best possible gift really yeah um, one of the kind of uh, wonderful things that we managed to do as, uh, as part of playing in the RSNO is uh, we have chair patrons. Yes. Um, so, um, and this, um, this month, the month of March, is dedicated to our chair patrons. Uh, your chair patron is Lady Anne and David Smith. Mm. Um, what does that mean to you t to have a chair patron? And, um, you know, any, any anecdotes or mm. anything along those lines? I mean, it's such a wonderful, um, it's such a wonderful scheme. And I think to have people, obviously it's great for the orchestra, but like for me as an individual, to have people in the audience supporting the orchestra that I feel genuinely are there and care about me, gives me a real purpose in my music making to, to do my best for them too. Um, I'm lucky that Anne and David are just absolutely wonderful people. Um, and so generous with their, their support and, and their time, not just, uh, you know, on a musical level, but we um, have got to know them personally, Kennedy and I, because Kennedy's also supported by them. Um, so we've, we've really, um, we've got to know them as people, um, you know, it's, it's lovely having their feedback and um, what they've enjoyed in, in concerts. I, we, I love that, that relationship. Um, and we've spent a lot of time with them sort of out with, the orchestra as well and they've got to meet our son Torben and even the dog I think um, and it's it's just so such a special relationship that I think um, and I, I certainly feel a in a really good way a sort of responsibility to them to um, to, to do everything I can to, to present something that I think they're going to enjoy and it's exciting for me if I know I've got something coming up, say a concerto, that they will, they'll, I know that they'll feel really proud and that's, mm. that's so valuable to me, you know, it's, um, we always love to, people to feel proud of us um, and doing something for someone and, and knowing that they'll feel proud is, is lovely. Yeah, I, I really like the idea of that, you know, anything to, to take away the idea of orchestra audience you know and, and bring it together absolutely is, is, is fantastic. and you know as I said before for me giving that gift of, of musical communication and, and being able to to use that as a tool is the most important thing in my job and I think that's why I've found this period of time really difficult because I haven't hmm. seen an audience really I've I had one week where I played to an audience in Switzerland last year which I was really lucky to, to do but that I've forgotten how 
important that is. You know, making music is fabulous, mm -hmm. but giving it and sharing it is actually the bit I really like. Yeah. Did you see that video? There's a Jonas Kaufman video. And he, no. I think he, he, was in, he was in Madrid. This is only in the last few weeks. And he sort of said to camera, I, I honestly thought I'd be fine without having an audience. And then it was quite sort of like, oh, wow, he's really like, he finds it. He, he sort of fronted up and said, I really, I can't do it. I can't cope without them. We really, really need. Um, to need to have that that, that contact with, with people. Mm. Um, yeah. So it's, but it's interesting, isn't it? Like football teams and football matches are having the piped. Yeah. So I often think, do we have to, should we have sort of a few coughs and a bit of applause and some sweet <laughs> rappers, you know, <laughs> just to make us feel kind of like, you know, but even one person, if we're recording in this room and, and one person walks into the balcony, you know, from the, the management, yeah. I immediately, I feel yeah. different. Um, that's important, so, so important to me. So, um, that it's that shared experience. Getting down to the real nitty gritty of this, mm. how old's Torben? He's two and a half. He's two and a half. Which Mozart, Mozart concerto does he prefer? Is he a C major, <laughs> sorry, D major or G major? He is not a fan of the flute full stop. Really? Yeah. Awesome. So I would say um, he's a fan of uh, John Cage 433 when it comes to my flute playing. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> si silence. And uh, also, what about Ralph? Which of the concertos is Ralph Actually, into? Actually, Ralph, um, Ralph, I would probably say G major. G major. Yeah, he's more of a regal dog. He's more of a regal, regal dog. Regal beagle. Regal beagle. <laughs> so we'll go G major for Ralph. This um, has been a chat with our section principal flute, Catherine Bryan, and uh, she's performing the uh, fantastic Mozart uh, first flute concerto in G major. Uh, thanks ever so much for watching and um, I hope you enjoy the performance.